Hello everyone. Welcome to another coffee chat session of my YouTube channel, Data Science with Sam. So today's coffee chat session is mainly related to actual science and how data play a crucial role in actual science field of study. Today, I join, um, one of the very esteemed guests from actual field joined me for this session. So I have Mary Pat Campbell. So he's a life annuity actuary working for Corning in insurance research. She's also a member of the Fellow of the Society of Actuaries and also a member of the American Academy of Actuaries. With a background in physics and applied math, Mary Pat has worked on a variety of model types and is a founding member of the modeling section at the SOA. So SOA means I'm talking about the Society of Actuaries. So they'll be very interesting for the actuaries. Uh, she's also a prolific author in actual publication and has a blog covering mortality and public finance. I would definitely recommend you to look down in the video section where actually I share the blog link. And I'll definitely recommend you to just visit her link, a uh, blog, and you know, get some information about actual science and statistics and other stuff. Uh, she can be found in most anywhere actually is, you know, gather online. She will be a very, she's very like active on social media and LinkedIn especially. So anyway, with further ado, I'm going to ask Mary that, you know, thank you. And thank you for joining me for this coffee chat session. I hope my viewers will get benefited from this session as well. So let's get started with the first question, Mary. So uh, I know that, you know, like data plays a really big role in the insurance industry. Uh, because I've been working in insurance industry for almost a decade. I've seen that how data have been evolved, how people carry out different uh, insurance uh, finance activities using data. So I would like to know more about from you that how data plays crucial role in the actual science in that kind of field of study. So if you can just, you know, provide some sort of like information for my viewers, then it'll be great. What to you, Mary? Yeah, so, yeah, so actuarial science is all surrounding the quantification of risk and now a lot of people will think oh that's you know financial engineering no well that's very specific um so it's like all types of risk and it got founded originally the actuarial part i would say was around mortality tables which is kind of where i i fit i'm a life actuary which means i think about death rates um and uh, the insurance industry first started out with risk sharing and like Lloyd's and shipping and stuff like that. But ultimately, if we were going to have a really modern industry, we needed to have the statistics and data that we could appropriately pr put a price, put a price right. on risk that you could charge. Um, actually on the life side, because life insurance was so fraught with difficulties, early on, um, it was actually life annuities. And you had people like Edmund Halley of Halley's Comet, who was developing mortality tables and basically how would you price a life annuity, which is you know an annual series annual of payments until up, the yeah. person yeah. dies. Um, and they were working, you know, this is what 17th century, they're working on very limited data mm -hmm. uh, when they really got started. Um, so, you know, it's, it's been kind of a back and forth. And one of the aspects, even though it's called actuarial science, we'll just admit almost anything that has the word science after it is not a science usually. Um, it's, it's actually um, kind of a whole tool bag of techniques that we steal from all sorts of places to apply to the business of like, insurance and pensions and other types of non-purely financial making promises. So life contingencies is what I'm, you know, whether you're alive or dead, but also there's property risks, um, casualty risks, um, catastrophe risks that, sorry, <coughs> we can put a dollar sign basically on risk that's not purely financial. Yeah, I mean, it's so fascinating that you mentioned that, you know, this, um, the mortality table practice, it started way back in 17th century when people, so people already started considering the risk assessment and they started putting uh, kind of a dollar on the, you know, how to assess the risk using mortality table back in those days. And uh, it'll be fascinating to see that how this thing evolved in the other areas of line, you know, business like property casualty and other stuff, you know, obviously they do have uh, different tables, not related to mortality, but obviously, and for on different metrics as well. 
Yeah. Um, so, I mean, my specialty is in life. So it, it is going to be surrounded a lot more with mortality. And then we also have what's called morbidity or, around disability. Um, but for like property and casualty, uh, what's interesting is just all the different kinds of coverages there are on PNC. And um, while we actually kind of have to share data between insurance companies on the life side uh, to get, um, because you only die once and it takes a long time. So the life insurance policies or annuities last decades. That's not common on the property and casualty side. That's true. Often you have a policy, policy year just lasts one year or maybe six months even. Um, and you have a pretty tight feedback loop at least on property risks most of the time um, that you're going to find. And so that's actually getting back to data. It's kind of what, what's the critical mass of data you need to actually be able to do this distinguishing of price prices and risk levels. Um, and the amount of data we have to accumulate and how rapidly it accumulates differs on the PNC side versus the life side. Um, I know with reinsurance companies, of course, because they're aggregating risks from exactly. the primary uh, mm -hmm. insurers, it doesn't take them long at all to aggregate enough data in order to be able to base decisions off of their own data sets. But for stuff like mortality, usually because it takes a long time before you get that death coming in. Exactly. Um, mm -hmm. it, we really have to aggregate it. So you can see I have it in my background and mm -hmm. on my um, on my fleece here, I'm a member of the Society of Actuaries, as you mentioned. And the SOA is one of the organizations that does these mortality studies, where it aggregates across the industry because it takes basically everybody uh, in order to get adequate experience. And that's not just life insurance, but also pensions, um, where we we're having to bring all of that data in. Um, and that's even just for the United States, which is like the largest insurance market in the world. <laughs> and we still need an organization like the SOA. And then there's some other, there's on the PNC side, there's a variety of kind of data providers um, and aggregators uh, that do stuff. But the, the issue is, of course, when we get the data coming in, that's stuff in the past. So part of the art of actuarial science is projecting into the future because it doesn't matter. And this is what I try to explain to people with the mortality from the past year and a half that, um, well, it's, it's all very well and good that we saw what happened with COVID mortality, yeah. but are we really expecting that to be what's going forward? And then yeah. what if there are, are more- Are we gonna candidates? modify the market and, table, you know, given that what we saw in no. COVID-19? Yeah. And I'm like the people who survived 2020 and 2021, hmm. we're not necessarily expecting them to have worse mortality in the future. If you look at prior pandemics, uh, like the Spanish, Spanish flu, flu, which was, yeah. Yeah. Which was the, I mean, it's not the prior, there, we've had several, pandemic since the Spanish flu, but that was the biggest one biggest and the one. one with the worst mortality worldwide. And um, it, like the mortality, like it was a dip. Um, if you looked at the period life expectancy, it like dropped nine years in yeah. one year, cool. yeah. but the very next year it, it almost entirely recovered. So, you know, it's like, if you survived the year, <laughs> <laughs> probably you'll be okay. Um, and, and we won't be pricing life insurance. We shouldn't be based on the worst of the pandemic. Yes. But that's also what reinsurance is there for and, and retrocession uh, when we had a really bad mortality year. Um, but anyway, uh, we couldn't do this. We couldn't make essentially affordable life insurance without having data to be able to, to support what price we should put on this. Um, early on in the life insurance industry, there were lots of insurer failures from not being able to quantify well, partly, and also fraud. Uh, that's the other that's I mean, because I guess the fraudulent um, claims and those kind of data are like very crucial for any kind of actual risk judgment, when, especially when it comes to like, you know, doing mortality study. Well, yeah, and, and, and so fraud doesn't come up 
as often on the life side. But I know in property and casualty, I mean, data is, and what kinds of patterns that we hear in data, um, that we see in data and expect, um, certain people are good at finding fraud uh, based on certain qualities in the, um, in the data that comes in for claims. Yes. This does, again, this does not come up as often in life, but I used to work for SCORE Global Life on the, I mean, on the life reinsurance side. And um, we had to investigate every very large claim. So any life insurance policy over a certain amount, we absolutely looked into it. And usually where the fraud would be, obvious, the person, it's hard to fake a death. People still try, but yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's <laughs> hard to fake a death. Yeah. Usually where the fraud would be, would be in the underwriting. Yeah, so did exactly. they really qualify to get a policy of specifically that size and then that underwriting class? Um, I mean, it gets very, uh, yeah. So that's the other, the other aspect that I didn't get into. It's like, it's not merely just mortality rates. Some of it is we're trying to detect, is there really a lot more risk in a certain situation than the insurance company mm -hmm is aware of. So this is asymmetric information. And sometimes this is called um, selection risk um, in terms of the insured person or business or whatever knows that they have a lot more risk than the insurance company knows um, and is trying to get coverage, you know, for less than what it, it's actually worth. Um, again, this, this, is, this is actually part of being an actuary is a mix of knowing the math and the theory, but also the real world aspect of how do people actually behave? You know, how do businesses actually exactly. run, you know? Um, so it's, it's a nice mix of, I would say statistics, math, and yeah, I mean, that's psychology. why I think it's coming into the actual <laughs> science terminology, because again, I mean, we can consider mathematics and statistics kind of a, like a part of the science, because obviously oh, yeah. when you use the terms, I think that's why maybe this actual science kind of relevant. I mean, even if it's, as you said, it's not science, but since the evolve, you know, the engagement of mathematics and statistics, maybe cons making it consideration as a part of the science. I mean, that's yeah, kind of I'm like a, my uh, judgment on this thing. <laughs> yeah, I'm not trying to get too deep into the philosophy of knowledge mm -hmm. here. Um, if we just go back to the original meaning of science, which just was a way of knowing. Yeah, it's like a it's definitely discovery. a way yeah, of exactly. knowing. Yeah, yeah, because it you I would say um, you really need to know a lot about reality in terms of how things actually are. And I mean, and this comes back to data as are, am I looking at real data or something fake? And that actually has come up in something I wrote recently, um, which will be published, I think in November. Um, it relates to um, Dan Ariely. I don't know if you've heard of him, um, the upside of irrationality and, um, he had something about the dishonest or the honest truth about lying. Well, it turns out one of the uh, experiments or one of the pieces of research he had published is fraudulent. Um, and it was based on car insurance. Um, and what happened was, and this wasn't an actuary who discovered this, uh, it was someone who has been going through published articles in academia to check okay, they disclose the data that they base their results on. So this is again, data. And I'm gonna go through and I'm going to take, make reasonability checks, make sure that the conclusions they say the data support are actually supported, et cetera, et cetera. And then they found there were some very strange patterns in the data that made no sense. I mean, that, uh, again, similarly, that's it, you know, like, yeah. I mean, without data, it's not be possible to find out that thing, right? You know, like, again, it's the data is basically yeah. playing a crucial role to find out. They would have owned, yeah. Would you, yeah. You wouldn't have known it was fraudulent. I mean, it sounded the, the specific results, and I don't want to get into it, sounded reasonable. There didn't, there was nothing about the research itself that raised any red flags per se, 
until you actually started digging through the data and you're exactly. like, hey, wait a minute, there's all this strange stuff. Similarly, now this is a different situation where we absolutely were expecting fraud. Mm -hmm. and it's election fraud, uh, just wait, in Russia, um, that there are statisticians working in Russia who discovered very unnatural patterns in vote counts um, coming out in the last decade. Okay. Now we ex absolutely expect fraud from Putin, but you know it's it was interesting the patterns they found. Um, so understanding like what real data that's generated by real processes of people just doing their thing versus something that has been faked up in some way. And that is something that, you know, in claims investigation happens at insurance companies. You know, it's not the only thing, but it's something that actuaries need to be aware of when we do our work. Yeah. So that that's kind of like, yeah. yeah, so that kind of like brings me to the next question, you know, like, like in your mm -hmm. actual practice, you know, I know we do have that actual standard of practice, which the acronym is ASOF, like, so the ASOF, ASOF, yeah. ASOF, yeah, <laughs> ASOF 23 or ASOF 25 or something like that. So the, right. So when you actually talk about this ESO for actual standard of practice, so how do you actually follow that kind of guidelines to maintain the data quality or even data integrity of the data which you are using for your mortality study practice or any sort of other risk analysis or judgment, actual judgment? Yeah, and I was gonna, you know, I recommend people who are involved in modeling to look at the actual standards of practice. So. Uh, actuaries, credentialed actuaries in the US have to follow these standards. There are 56 of them. They don't apply to all of us. There's different ones for property and casualty and life and that, but there's some that apply to all of us. And ASOP 23, which is on data quality, basically all actuaries have to deal with that one. Um, another one's ASOP 41, like my top three are ASOP 23, data quality, ASOP 41, actuarial communications, and ASOP 56 which is modeling. modeling so if yeah. you're, yeah. Um, so I highly recommend, even though all actuaries have to follow these in the US, I'm recommending non-actuaries who have to work with data to look at these because you don't have to be an actuary to understand what these ASOPs are about. ASOP, they're very short, they're very high level. You're basically saying, these are the things you really need to do to have a work product with integrity, reliability, you know, that you can build your reputation. So the actuarial um, profession has built its reputation for integrity, high quality work, et cetera, mm -hmm. surrounded by, because there are consequences if we don't follow these as a credentialed actuary. But ASAP 23 is not saying that you have to do a detailed audit of your data, but, it says, here are ways that data can go wrong. These are the kinds of checks that you really should take a look at. Um, and, and you should, it, it's like basically trust, but verify. Mm -hmm. You really need to check that you understand the data you're looking at. So let me give you an example. I, I keep, I'm going to keep using COVID examples, sorry. Uh, I one think that's very really relevant. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think it'll be better if I use that, um, partly because I've been looking specifically about COVID mortality data, which I've looked at very carefully over the last two years or year and a half, um, that um, I'm getting data from the CDC essentially, but also other like Johns Hopkins had a dashboard Hopkins, and other yeah, ones. Definitely. And so you see various news stories talking about, oh, record number of deaths and blah. And, I, and given my background, I'm like, wait a second. Okay, and is this when the deaths were reported? Or when they occurred, because exactly. like most of the there graphs are, and dashboards, there's a lag you between saw. those two periods. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, like everybody, everybody in insurance knows about IABNR incurred but not reported. Exactly. Um, but also, we know there's a lag between something when it occurs and when it's reported. But the big one, this is what people were asking me. People are dying less on the weekends. I'm like, no, people are not dying less on the weekends. What's happening 
is that you're looking at the death counts based on when the deaths were reported, not when they happened. And a lot of people don't work on the weekends, so you're not getting data from them on the weekends. You get a little surge on Monday and maybe sometimes Tuesday, depending. Um, and you could also see death numbers go down at holidays. And like people, so my husband came in the other day, like, oh, the COVID deaths went to zero in a certain geography. Like, no, he didn't. This was during a holiday. They, someone took a vacation. There's one person in charge in that county for recording deaths exactly. <laughs> to the CDC. And they obviously took a vacation for a week. Okay, this is based I mean, on if you know that's what the data are, if yeah. you know that it's by when it was reported as when it was occurred. This makes a huge difference. And a lot of people get on actuaries for being so detail oriented, like, oh, what does it matter? You know, it's like, well, it does make a big difference if there are no COVID deaths in a week period where you had been having dozens before versus someone took a vacation and it's just, you, you haven't caught up There's with the reporting lag yet. Anyone who's had to set an, a claim reserve for the claims that have not yet been reported, know that if anything happens in the claims reporting process, you need to know about it um, so that you don't get a distorted idea of what's happening with claims. Because you need to have enough money on hand exactly. to pay those Definitely. insurance claims. I mean, you got actually enough money yeah. to pay that. And it's very crucial to understand the time period. And that actually kind of reminds me of one very famous quote, which I guess very uh, popular in actual science world as well in data science world is the correlation does not imply causation, right? So most of the time we try to correlate based on the data we see, but we don't try to find out is it the underlying story of what you're seeing right now? I understand seeing is believing, but sometimes yeah. you've got to actually dig down and find out what exactly going on. That, and that, I mean, that's an actual, actually, that's a really good point because some of it for actuarial science, generally we're not, and again, the way I say it's not science as people think, we can't do experiments. We're just getting the data as the world is giving it to us. Um, and and it's it's not even like even if we tried to change how we priced something or something like that, the regulators would we have to we are in this environment where there are regulators where there is the business to be run, you know. There's and there's different levels of regulation and and lots of different moving exactly. parts. Definitely. So yeah. So I mean, just getting back to this ASAP twenty three we get into the habit of first understanding what the data are. You get a database. Usually I try to make sure I understand what the different fields are. This has actually gotten a lot of actuaries in trouble um, for actuarial malpractice lawsuits. And yes, those do exist. Um, where somebody had a coding, like it was a flag zero one and they misinterpreted that flag. One block of business I worked on, we had sent um, a policy, you know, a seriatim policy file. So it's all the different annuities, uh, annuity contracts and the valuation company we were sending it to. So they were coming back with the number, they were modeling our stuff, misinterpreted the policy file of what our flag zero one meant. And I was the person who caught it on the, and I'm like, oh crap. And I have to come up with what's the difference between what it should have been and what they gave us. Um, and it was, uh, you know, because it was all actuaries involved, it was fault on both sides. And no law lawsuits occurred, we, we worked it out. Mm -hmm. But it's like, we, the whole point is understand the data you're looking at, know how data can go wrong. So there's lots of different ways you can get wrong information. This is really important right now with automated underwriting and electronic health records, there's a lot of bad data, bad data in those yeah. records. Mm -hmm. I like it came in and everybody, if they saw this, they, they'd know this is false. It's like, it was recorded my weight is zero. Pretty sure I have mass. Um, you know, it's because of something that happened when I went to a doctor's visit, they didn't weigh me. And so they just moved on to whatever the next thing is. Knowing the difference between a real zero and a no data, field, you know, that kind of thing. That happens to me all the time. I have to look yeah. at uh, financial data and I need to know, is it just not reported yet or is it really a zero? 
in that mm -hmm. entry. Sometimes that, yeah. you know, like the digesting the metadata of the like different identifiers columns also very useful because EHR data, like electronic health records data, huge, yeah. you know, like it's so much data in there and so many columns, identifiers. Sometimes you need to actually comprehend the meaning of all the identifiers, like what the, you know, the patient time or well, something means, right? Yeah. I mean, some of, one of the things that people were talking about, if you're going through this, hmm. you can't just go by whatever the billing code or whatever code is on there. They may have been testing for something. They might not have had that. That's not the actual yeah. diagnosis. They were just testing for something um, and it got ruled out. Uh, for the longest time, here's something on my prescription record, and I'm glad the doctor went over it with me so they could clear it out. I'm like, I haven't taken that in 10 years. You. you know, it's just like there was that was prescribed, but I took it for only one cycle and then it didn't work. And I just dropped, you know, I stopped taking it. Um, but if it comes through an insurance company, they're like, oh, they, I mean, I'm making something up. They have kidney disease, blah. I'm like, it would also show up in other places if I really had kidney disease, that's one hard to miss. Um, you know, there's a lot of people don't realize you you build this up and a lot of this is you learn on the job. And that's, that's part of the aspect <laughs> because it's very specific sometimes to the kind of insurance you're looking at. Um, mm. It's hard to take a class on some of these. And that's what's interesting about the ASOPs. Most of the standards of practice are, um, best practices, accepted, not accepted practices, expected practices, expected practices yeah. that actuaries built up from practical approaches. I mean, and that's the aspect here. They're, these are all manageable. We're not asking anybody to do anything superhuman. Um, so for the ASOP 23, we didn't say you have to audit, meaning really detailed investigation of the data, but you should have reasonability checks. You, exactly. ha you should know what the ranges of the results are. So some of the problems, this is like the Especially old- When it comes to biometric data, you need to know yeah. that range of a different medical test result, whether it's blood pressure, glucose, or- Yeah, well, like, but, if, but if, someone, if someone like mistyped and the, the blood pressure yeah. came in, the systems usually have some data validation built in, but sometimes they don't. What if it says, oh, it's 1800 over 50 is your blood pressure. That is not possible. Okay, that is absolutely not possible. <laughs> hmm. Or if like the temperature was uh, recorded as ninety degrees Celsius instead of fair, you know, not, instead of Fahrenheit hmm. and that kind of thing. I mean, I think the example, of course, I guess, is the one NASA <laughs> thing that that failed because they it was like inches versus centimeters or something like that. They didn't realize you know, like the metric was being the used and, versus a fear system. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just like you yeah. have to know. Yeah. And that's actually an aspect of data. That's something people don't think about. I've run into this a lot in finance. Yeah. What currency are you working in? That's yeah, so we standardize huge. the data in that, that kind of metrics for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It just like, I've seen it sometimes where something came in and I'm like, that's not in us dollars. Oh, that's in Japanese yen. Yeah. That's what I thought. Cause it's like, <laughs> off by an order of magnitude of a hundred yeah. uh, kind of thing. So yeah, some of it is just very practical. Like make sure you know <laughs> what, and, and that you should check. It's more of getting into the discipline. Okay. You, you should be checking, you know? And that's what I'm saying. You don't have to be an actuary to have that exactly. discipline. Exactly, I mean, like right? you really bring a very valid point and I could relate to that. So being a kind of like an insurance professional working with, uh, actually is very closely for last I guess seven to eight years I've been like very much you know familiar with this ASOP 20 25 because I know that when I was working with actuaries I need to know those kind of guidelines I need to know at least the basic of the guidelines so when I basically collaborate with an actuary when I perform any sort of data management or data analytics activities for actual judgment I should make sure that I also follow some sort of that guidelines from ASOP 23 and ASOP 25. Well, and I think, yeah, we yours. appreciate, I mean, we appreciate it because then we're going to have to do that work, whether you do it or not, exactly. you know, 
Yeah, so and that is something you know a very uh, beneficial for my viewers, especially uh, I guess I'm pretty sure a lot of my viewers are working in the insurance industry. I would definitely encourage them. It doesn't matter whether you're an actuary or non-actuary. Echoing what Mary Pat says, you know, like you should actually know some of the actual standard of practice because that will definitely help you out in any of your SOX audit compliance or any sort of regulatory <laughs> work, right? And yeah, and, and it's it again in the audit process. Yeah, if you work with or if you know an actuary. Mm -hmm. You can ask them, the, but ASOP 23 would be the big one. That's data quality. These things are only like 10 pages long and most of it's white space. And then almost all of it is like, uh, most of it's like defining the terms exactly. of what we mean. What do we mean by data or, you know, that kind of thing. Data frame. Well, I don't think okay. data frame's in so, there, but you know what the data frame is, obviously. Exactly. So, yeah. <laughs> so Mary, I mean, that kind of like, kind of like brings me to the next question. Okay. This, I mean, I know we talked about data, data quality, data integrity. So now, as we all know, we are literally living in 21st century and that era is kind of like taking us to that AI machine learning in that world. So given uh -huh. the kind of like issues you encountered so far in last few decades in your actual work, do you think that, you know, bringing artificial intelligence and machine learning will help you guys out? Or in future, a data scientist like me will actually collaborate with you to help you you know, maybe manage the data in a better way, maybe build a bot who will actually manage the data quality and data integrity stuff for you. So how do you envision yeah. you know, like how things will look like in future? We're ho yeah, I mean, the thing is we hope, okay. <laughs> okay, so okay, again, I know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, but I think it's yeah. Very, I mean, it, it's it course. can be very. I'm just so I, I do want to reflect not some utopian vision, but like how it actually is work, working or not working, as the case may be. Um, this just there's the future and then there's now. Um, so I'm actually going to go 100 years into the past, mm -hmm. uh, into the founding of the Casualty Actuarial Society. So that's the PNC side, uh, property and casualty side. Um, they founded their own society partly because their interests were not being satisfied mm -hmm. on um, on a pension and life insurance dominated society. Well, it wasn't the SOA, but the precursor. Um, but also the original society was CASA. It was Casualty Actuarial and Statistical Science mm -hmm. um, Association, I, I think. And um, the, they were with statisticians. In property and casualty, statisticians, which was the, the I guess, the stodgy term uh, for data scientists. I know it has a real meaning, I know. But I'm just saying a lot of the data sciences is, is basically statistics remark exactly you know, i mean they're literally going into the status because without yeah i mean it's statistics i don't think so the data science role well you wouldn't have well you wouldn't have the validity yeah. without the statistical underpinning mm -hmm. um but the thing is the statisticians kind of wandered away uh from the society part of it may be some statisticians because it's their knowledge of how statistics work and not necessarily the data set they're looking at mm -hmm. um, didn't feel tied specifically to insurance but could you know wander around multiple field multiple mm -hmm. industries I should say that it still works um, so it gets a bit touchy among actuaries because especially on the property and casualty side there's always the mm -hmm. they're taking our jobs a storyline that comes up every so often, and it's statisticians. It was data mining back in the 80s, you know, and then there was GLMs and stuff like that, um, uh, generalized linear models uh, on PNC yes. uh, in the 90s, early 2000s. Now we've got machine learning and AI. Um, and so actuaries often try to put up a barrier to keep people from encroaching in our in our areas. I don't think that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, that said, if you have, th this is something we run into it with IT. It's not just data science, but IT, the statisticians and stuff. It'd be great, you know, if we're all a team um, working on these problems together uh, and actuaries are not going to be the statistical experts. We're not going to be the IT experts, but we do need to know about how IT systems work or how it's structured and how that 
comes in. That's partly how we understand our data. Um, but we also need to understand how these models work or don't work, as the case may be. Um, we're not going to be the ones coding these and having the modules and this, that, and the other. We want to use this as an input. We go to vendors um, with their software and this, that, and the other. Um, but we often have to tweak it so that it can work for what we need to do. Because the challenge of insurance compared to like Amazon using AI or uh, Google using AI is we are heavily regulated um, on multiple levels. So we can't have a fully unconstrained model. And we're running into trouble with this because the statisticians will come in, you say correlation and causation, there's lots of correlations in the data um, that are real, they are real. These are not spurious correlations, but the regulators do not like them and they really don't like you using them for pricing. I'll just give the very specific one, which is credit scoring. Mm -hmm. There is a very strong correlation between auto claim, personal auto claims and credit scores of the, per, the person who's insured. Um, that's, that's good to Okay, know. It's, yeah. it's, no, this has existed for decades. This is not new knowledge on the PNC side. The regulators hate it um, in Washington state. The governor just, I think just with an executive order tried to say, no, you can't do that. And the judge said, this is not something you can do an executive order on. It needs to be actual legislation or whatever. Um, it's very contentious. It's a very strong correlation. So, I mean, um, yeah. Kind of like try to sum it up. So you are actually considering that it's not, it's kind of like maybe a worthwhile in future when actually we'll get more, I guess I would say insight about the model, all the other technical aspect of any sort of like a GLM or any predictive model from a data scientist. Maybe a data scientist could be, could help them to you know, yes. get some understanding on the technical aspect of the model and maybe also help them in data management or maybe some sort of data engineering stuff as well. But, but I think the, I think most data scientists could learn how to do, or I mean, part of it might be to develop approaches that yeah. have constraints that yes, we can bring in this data, but we are constrained in how we can use it. Exactly. Um, uh, there needs to be for everyone in the team. It's like, it would be nice if we work together as a team, but often we don't. That's why I said, yeah. um, we don't wanna be utopian. Mm. Um, the actuaries do know that we can't do certain things. And a lot of times people coming from more of a pure data science background, outside of insurance are going like, but you know, we have all this data and, and then you have to say, I'm sorry, um, it's great. I agree, it'd be stronger correlations. And you know, the insurance company lawyers are fighting for this, but sometimes you just have to put up with the aspect that there is there are dimensions of the risk that you're not gonna be allowed to price on and that you're just going to have to deal. Um, that's reality. And that's part of, I think, the issue. People are like, oh, we can do A-B testing. We can do this. Um, you're unconstrained when it comes to marketing, say, but when it comes to that core actuarial work of pricing and reserving, no. <laughs> That's, that's yeah. very you know, like, uh, interesting to know. And I know I hopefully in future, we definitely be able to do a more handshake between an actuary and a data scientist, which will definitely take well, but, the insurance industry to the next level in the be, yeah, modernization. I mean, and the just to be controversial, it's not really controversial in the insurance space, but one of the reasons that these outsider groups like Google and Amazon trying to get into insurance has not worked out that well is because they're coming from an unconstrained environment and insurance is not I like think, that. Yeah. I yeah. think that's why insured tech concept is also coming. I'm not sure that I know the whole actual community is already receptive to that insured no, tech no, idea, but I guess- No, would be so a I want to be specific. Hmm. Insure tech is there and has been doing really well. And there's hmm. lots of AI and stuff being used in insurance, but it's from people coming from an insurance from the background. Industry, big tech yeah, because they understand the environment you have to operate in. There's a lot of, I, I, I'm not going to name any names. It's just like, I think there's a lot hmm. of success successes already, wins already, and other promising ideas, but they're mainly coming from people with a practical knowledge 
and yeah, you can have the tech and you can have, you know, whatever new algorithms, yeah. but you absolutely you need un to have the subject matter, right? And that's where oh, the yeah. is coming in place. You know, I don't think so. Data scientists will be able to a successful, you know, like working professionally in the insurance industry without getting help from a subject yes. matter, like an uh, actuary. So yeah, that's literally. Yeah. And I think, you know? I mean, the actuaries need to understand at least what's, what kind of models are available and what it can do. Um, and as I said, how it can break. But I think, but I, I've, I've had a lot of sour stories from people who've dealt with, it was just freshly minted statistical PhD, statistics PhDs, bringing all their tools out and saying they gave me no useful results that I could mm. do anything with that the answers they gave me were meaningless in an insurance environment. That the funniest one was um, policy year 2016 was really um, profitable. So you should get a time machine and write more business in 2016. <laughs> I mean, it was an unused, I mean, that was an easily fixable uh, problem, but there are other things like that where you're like, no, I'm sorry. We're not going to be able to sell more to men than to women say, or, you know, there's certain categories you're like, nah, uh, we can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> like, so anyway, so yeah, Mary, I mean, that's kind of literally, uh, thank you for the, you know, like great discussion. I, yep. I got a lot of information. I'm pretty sure my viewers, both from non-insurance and insurance industry will get uh, benefited from that. So before I wrap it up, you know, I just wanted to ask you, do you have any tips or any suggestion for the aspiring actuary that if they want to like excel in the insurance industry, what kind of like a thing they should follow, especially when it comes to like handling data and other stuff, what an actuary should, you know, like follow kind of a guidelines or something. I know you mentioned ASOP, but anything else? Yeah, you know, like well, and, and the... Yeah, if you're early on, so I'll just assume, say, someone who's still taking exams, you need to have that balance between studying for the exams. That theory gets you only so far. You really need to pay attention to the actual business going on around you. I came in with a lot of math. The math wasn't the challenging part. It was learning how the business and the people actually are. Pay attention to that. We don't, I don't think we emph emphasize that enough. Yeah. So. And that's true yeah. for data science too. No, it's I mean, not just the theory too. and the code. We need to understand the math and statistics. Yeah, because yeah. I was I was <laughs> literally seeing people just just trying to learn R and Python to become a data scientist, but that's not the thing. I mean, if you see my tagline of my uh, you know the data science YouTube uh -huh. channel, it's not about data; it's about science. You also need to understand the mathematics and statistics behind a model. Okay, it's not like that. You just if you know if you're efficient in R and Python, that doesn't like apply that you will become a data scientist. So I think it's very uh -huh. relatable for any field of study, it's not only whole... data science and actual science. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a whole sphere of and other things and this exactly it's, it's a venn diagram <laughs> it's just yeah so yeah it, yeah there's that old data science but you need to understand what you're applying the data science to exactly to Abs whether you're an actuary data scientist coming into insurance you need to understand it's in a world that's not disconnected from reality yeah I mean, it's hopefully just I will textbooks. see in future there will be more ventures between data science and actuary. I mean, like we yeah. already co collaborated on this YouTube channel, so we'll do more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Mary, for your time. And I'm pretty sure my okay. viewers, uh, my subscribers will definitely be benefited from this uh, YouTube session, uh, the Coffee Chat one. And to my viewers, you know, please follow Mary Katz and you know, Pat Campbell's, you know, like vlog, because she actually provides a lot of information on her YouTube channel and vlog, which you can actually just follow and get a lot of information about actual science, mathematics, and maybe a little bit of statistics, which we need to acquire for, you know, like your data science career, because I would, as Mary said, you know, in an insurance industry, a data scientist needs to work with the subject matter. And actually, uh, it, they are the main subject matter of the insurance industry. So I think from this coffee chat session, you understand that how actual science play a crucial role in the insurance industry and how it's actually used data to resolve some of the actual judgment or some insurance practices. And that should be beneficial for anyone working for the insurance industry. So having said that, uh, that I, I'm actually going to wrap up this session. I'm going to thank Mary for her time and you know everything you know she provided to us during this session. Thanks, Mary. And this session is very informative. 
I mean, working for insurance uh, industry for a long year, I still believe I found some information which has been new to me in this session. So thanks for everything, Mary. And um, that's all for now. And thanks viewers for watching this coffee chat session. I'll definitely be back with more um, coffee chat session with uh, industry experts. So please stay tuned and don't forget to like and subscribe to my channel. Uh, so till then, goodbye. Thanks, Mary. Great talking with you.